All right, joining me now on the Deep Cover podcast is Nick's content legend, <laughs> CP the franchise. Uh, you may have recognized him from CSXM, Sirius XM, sorry, <laughs> or on ESPN, where he dominated Max Kellerman. <laughs> so, uh, CP, first of all, thank you for joining the podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? Yeah, hey, Omar, doing well, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I want to get started like I do with anyone who covers a team that they're a fan of. You know, how did you get into the Knicks, liking the Knicks, being a fan of the Knicks? Yeah. It's like, what was that moment where you really latched onto the team? Yeah, well, just being born and raised in New York and in the early 90s, you know, when I started just kind of making sense of the game, it, what you used to watch, you know, the Nick doubleheader, triple headers on NBA on NBC, it would be Knicks versus Bulls, Knicks versus Pacers, you know, Knicks versus Celtics. And uh, as a New Yorker, you just felt like oh, I have no choice but to rally around these guys. And, you know, when you looked up and down that roster, number one, it started with Patrick Ewing, uh, Jamaican, my family from Jamaica and so we always carry that country pride no matter what field that you're in we're always going to back you 1000% and seeing that he was the captain of the team and that the team would go as far as he took them and how hard he worked to help his team win that became my team instantly and they just had an aura a demeanor an identity about them you know gritty grimy played physical played hard it was just something that we embodied as everyday people and and so it was just very easy to get behind that team. And then on top of that, the best part of sports is the unscripted nature of sports. And so you'd be watching these games. And yeah, unfortunately, when Jordan and the Bulls would come into town, you had the greatest player in the game against a, a, a ragtag Nick team, the underdogs, if you will. And I always wanted to root for those underdogs. I always wanted to see them upset Jordan and the Bulls or see them get the best of Reggie and the Pacers, especially when Reggie was carrying on with his antics. And so, again, it just made it that much easier to really love this team, and, and that's who I've been with ever since. Yeah, I always kind of have a funny story where my first exposure to the Knicks was during the OJ car chase. So, yeah, you know, I remember. I was, yeah, so I was like seven, eight years old at the time, and I was transfixed by Ewing and the rest of the team. And I've been a fan myself ever since. You know, I grew up in Queens. So nice. it's it's something that, you know, I've latched on to the underdog aspect. You know, that's kind of uh, motivated us all the way through the 90s and 2000s to what we're at today. Yeah. Uh, but I kind of want to lead into Knicks fan TV. TV. Obviously, you're <clears throat> super successful with the, within the content space for Knicks content. So what led you to want to create that to delve into the content space for covering the Knicks? Yeah, the team had gone through some dark times, especially after that 90s run. You know, after the Houston Sprewell era, the team was kind of just really tripping over itself with bad management and investing in, in players, investing large amounts of 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 operational assets into players that weren't necessarily going to move the needle for them. They were enveloped into certain scandals. And so overall, the media coverage when it came to the team was in regards to those scandals or who was the next big name that they're going to target. At the same time, locally, the coverage was very limited to just a 10 minute post game show. And then after that, it's pretty much done. And where the team was in that post Ewing era, they weren't getting much coverage on the radio either. And so as time progressed, the coverage w was just inadequate, in my opinion. And when I was looking online and, and really consuming content in the YouTube, that 24 seven on demand uh, era, I noticed that there wasn't much quality Knicks content there either. And so I just said, you know, we're New Yorkers. We are the diehard fans. We, we are the, the lifeblood when it comes to sports talk. And so I decided to really venture off and start that, um, in that YouTube era on that 24 seven on, on, on demand content era. And, you know, it, it's been a steady grind ever since. And uh, the thing I find interesting about your show is that, especially in the post game aspect, you know, it's kind of like a reinvigoration of talk radio in a way, right? It's like, hey, aggrieved Knicks fans, call in, tell us what you liked, what you didn't like. You know, people kind of go crazy or people have good takes or whatever. What made you decide to go that route, the call-in route, yeah. as opposed to just live stream, 
answer comments, that sort of thing. That was just who I was as a fan. And growing up in that sports talk era, uh, I've told this story many a times, but it's true. Uh, Mike and the Mad Dog, WFAN 660, that was the foundation for all sports talk right now. When you look at First Take, you look at whatever Skip Bayless was doing in the past, those debate shows with the two talking heads, that all started with Mike and the Mad Dog. And as a kid, I used to listen to that on the radio after a Nick game, the day after a Nick game, the day after a Yankees game or a Giants game and hear them debating with each other, but also interacting with the fans and giving the fans a voice to, to voice their opinion on the team, whether it was positive or negative, whether it was after a great win or a heartbreaking loss, that connection between the host and the caller was something that never left me as a fan. And so I wanted to replicate that in the digital age. And I think you do a great job of it, honestly, because anytime I think back to my sports radio listening days and and I tune into one of your post games, it's the same vibe, right? With, and you get the unhinged caller, which is part of the appeal, yeah. you know, yeah. but you also get some really nuanced opin- opinions, right? Yeah. And that's something that's so unique. Now, of course, you're a fan or I'm a fan. There's a lot of fan-driven podcasts, shows, YouTube channels, whatever. Do you view this as a net a net positive for the media landscape? Because a lot of like old school journalism types, well, you can't be a fan and cover that team, right? Yeah. Like where do you stand on that whole, the whole uh, debate? Yeah. Well, I think those days are completely over and that old adage, that's out the window now. The barriers of entry, there are no barriers. You, you have a phone, right? This is our our camera and this is our TV all in one. And so on any platform that you're on, you can p- create your own broadcast. And, and, and I think that's valued and it's needed. And so I think as long as a host, as long as you are objective as you can be, there is space for the fan to call it down the middle. I mean, fans will call into my show. Fans who tune into my show know that it's not always going to be rosy. It's not always going to be pom-poms when it comes to to me and, and how I look at the team. And I think it brings about spirited debates. We have nights where we're all on the same page and we have nights where we have vociferous debates about a game or what's going on with the team. And I, I think it adds a lot of value uh, to, uh, you know, the conversations around the team and around the sport. And so I, I think this era of fan-driven media is really, in a, in a sense, stages just getting started. And I think that we're in a great, great time right now. You know, you spoke about objectivity. And me, as a person who does writing outside of this podcast, I always find it difficult to write about the Knicks and the Giants specifically because I have rooting interests. And I was recently doing a piece about Julius, and I really kind of took a lot of time with it because I was like, all right, I don't want to let this fandom of the Knicks and fandom of Julius that I have kind of get in the way of being objective. So how do you go about maintaining the objectivity considering your whole channel is based around the team. Yeah. To, to me, I just call it like how I see it. And one thing that I stress, because there have been times, there have been contentious times where, you, you know, players might have taken issue with things that were said on this channel. And it just is what it is. We're going to, host a platform for the fans to have their say and it's not going to always be pretty it's not going to be rosy the fans are the investors of the sport they are an important part of the ecosystem so their voices need to be heard and this is what our our platform is for uh but where i'm concerned listen if you have a good game we're going to talk about it positive positively if you have a bad game we're going to speak on it on the negative my whole thing is it's never personal it's never personal it is all about what we see as fans or what I see as a host and the game that I watched. And I'm just going to relay my opinion. And so in that way, I, I never let you know relationship with the team or relationship with certain players get in the way of me calling it just like how I see it. But at the end of the day, it's never personal. Have you ever been called on that? 
by somebody with the team or somebody kind of close with the team. Where it's like, hey, you know, I really don't like how hard you went on this guy's performance uh, when they played the Grizzlies or, or something like that. Is that something you've experienced yeah. or not really? Yeah, we, we had a situation where, uh, you, you know, Julius Randle, his wife in particular, um, you know, there was there's there's been times where the social media environment has been toxic towards him and his, and his family. And she kind of took us to task for kind of spearheading all of that. But again, my, my reply was that, you know, we don't encourage encourage fans to attack players personally. As a matter of fact, when I do my analysis, I don't at players or, or go on personal attacks. I, I very much do not uh, condone that whatsoever. And so we, I just explain my position that we just call it like it is. We call it down the middle and that we can't control, especially in this social media age, we can't control what every anonymous person says out there. Some of those people could just be trolls and detractors. And so just like anything else, you, you, you shouldn't even give those people life. You shouldn't give them any oxygen. Eventually they'll just die off. So, you know, the, the thing is, is that the athlete nowadays is so entrenched in the arena where these conversations are, are happening. And so, yes, they can take offense to what's being said, but I think by and large, the conversations around the game are more constructive or more positive in nature. It's just that sometimes the negativity can, can cloud the, the overall environment. Yeah, and that's the social media thing, right? You know, you throw a little random avatar on there and yeah. start saying whatever you want, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I think is interesting about the Knicks fan base is that it's incredibly large, incredibly diverse, because similar to the Yankees, I'd say, in that, resp in that respect. Um, how do you go about managing the different range of emotions that you're getting from callers on a night in night out basis. Like, do you find yourself having to kind of play like a regulator? Like, all right, you calm down, you do this, you do that. Or do you just like, Hey, the floor is yours. This is the platform for you and uh, go at it. Floor is yours. We don't, all we ask is to, is to keep it clean. You know, we're, we're not asking for any cursing or anything. We try to keep it a family show. That is a, that is our motto because we, we want people of all ages, children of all ages to, to be able to enjoy the, the platform. But at the end of the day, we don't censor or try to control how you feel after you, you just watch the game. Now, there are people who bring more constructive takes to, to the conversation and we, we might let them go a little bit more. And there's others who uh, may not have it together all the way, but we're still going to let their opinions be heard so all in all we we welcome all opinions and like you said the beauty of our fan base and the beauty of the way we produce our content is it's it's being viewed it's being digested by people all around the world and we have the capability to pull in those voices from all around the world. So some nights on Knicks Fan TV, you'll, you may hear uh, uh, my, people from the Philippines. You may hear people from India, from California, North Dakota, New York, all over the globe. And, and that's one of the things I love most about hosting the platform. You know, there's a big crowded space when it comes to covering sports now, covering teams. You know, how do you go about making yourself stand out? Yeah. You know, obviously you've uh, experienced a lot of success, a lot of subscribers and all that good stuff. So how do you go about just this is what makes me different than the hundred other NBA podcasts that are out there? Yeah, it starts with authenticity starts with being myself and you know the the person that you see in CP the franchise that's hosting Knicks fan TV it's the same person who if you're watching the Nick game at a bar or a restaurant with me it's it's the same person and I've always promised that I'm never gonna be anything other than who I am and so I'm not looking for uh, shock jock takes I'm not looking to, to be the loudest person in the room I'm just gonna be who I am I'm gonna give you my opinion I want to hear your opinion and that is gonna be the content that is gonna be uh, the the show that is Knicks fan TV. And so authenticity is vital in this era where there is a lot of competition and you're looking to separate yourself from the pack. You, you can't be uh, someone who you're not because it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of energy and that's just not sustainable. Secondly, consistency from the minute I picked up the camera on June 17, 2017 to, to cover the NBA draft. Uh, I promised myself that I was never going to put it down. I was going to see this, this, 
vision through, see this this project through and see where it took me. And that that promises to stay true to this day. Uh, seven, eight years later, I work on it every day, all day. And, and this is where it, it's taken me so far. So it's been a very rewarding journey. And so consistency is vital. If, if you're not consistent in it, then it means you're not passionate at it. And so if you're not passionate at it, then it may not be worth your time to pursue. So consistency has to be there. And then thirdly, it's it's value. Every With every piece of content that we make, it is for the sake of providing value to our audience, whether we are educating, we are inspiring, or we are entertaining, we are looking to provide value. There's so much platforms, there's so much content out there. People are swiping all day, every day. So how do we make them stop swiping? How do we make them stop and give us 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, an hour of their time, that means we have to provide value. So in all the content that we plan, all the content that we execute, it's with the end goal of we want to make sure that that person at home is getting the most out of it. Are they getting the most out of a guest that we have? You know, their insight, their opinion on the game. Are they getting inspired by, you know, uh, a life on the road or behind the scenes journey of Knicks Fan TV? Are they being inspired by that to pursue their own passions? Or are they being entertained? Some nights on Knicks Fan TV, like you said, you might have some callers, whether it's Ari from Manhattan or Jay Boogie the closer, right? Maybe after a tough loss, you get you get a Jay Boogie closing sermon that you know lifts up your spirits and it, it carries you forward throughout the whole week. We're all here for it, but like I said, at the end of the day, value is is the priority there. Now you kind of mentioned the time commitment or the time limitations that people have in the audience these days. You have a million former players coming up with their podcasts. And obviously they, those are the ones that get aggregated. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are on TikTok and stuff. And how do you view kind of standing out versus those podcasts? Because obviously people have heard of Paul George or yeah. Gilbert Arenas or, or whoever the case may be. So how do you find being able to kind of amplify your voice when more well-recognized names are out there in the space now? Yeah. I think there's there's a lane for everybody, even though it's competitive, everybody has their lane. And for where the players have an edge over everybody is their storytelling, because it's firsthand accounts. It's behind the scenes, you know, live and direct like a Paul George. You know, they're able to tell those stories that no one else can. And it kind of cuts out the middleman who once upon a time, it was that journalist in the locker room. Like, hey, let's talk about this. The players can go direct to consumer and share those stories. Stories. And that's why those clips are the ones that are typically going viral. But back to it goes back to your question before, if you're authentic and also you have a plan in terms of how you're delivering value, what is special about your platform? Again, there's something out there for everybody. And so for us, our platform is dedicated to the fans who want to have their opinions be heard on the team. And that's always going to be the value proposition for Knicks Fan TV and always what we're going to deliver, whether it's in long form content or in short form content. On top of that, we are going to bring in the top quality guests inside the game, whether it's us as the hosts, it's an Ian Begley, who's an insider with SNY. It's just Fred Katz, who's an insider with The Athletic and Alan Hahn, who's with the team with MSG. Is it a player? Is it a former coach? Like we're always going to continue to bring in those quality guests. So again, that we're, we're bringing value to our audience, but there's definitely uh, room for everyone in such a competitive environment. Yeah. I kind of look at the player one specifically, like, Jeff Teague, for example, that's a comedy hour. Yeah. Right. Like yeah, he's just yeah. telling funny stories. And, you know, Paul George is a lot of interview stuff. Like I remember he did the interview with uh, Julius, I think, a while back. And, <laughs> and you know, I tuned in for that because I, cause I care about that. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, but there's a lane for everyone. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of going into ESPN and FS1. You know, they have kind of made a lot of changes. Skip Bayless has been let go. ESPN's doubled down on McAfee and Stephen A. Smith. And they've really kind of, especially with the Pat McAfee aspect, really gone into the independent creator space as he is somebody who has built everything up on the ground up, right, after he finishes pro career. So how do you see this influx of more independent content creators 
really being infiltrated into traditional media houses like a, uh, like ESPN or like a Fox Sports or like a CBS Sports. Yeah, I, I think it's it's an ideal hybrid from a media standpoint where you're tapping in with an independent content creator who has strong brand equity. The brand equity was strong with Pat McAfee. The brand equity in Stephen A. Smith is strong. And so, you know, especially in the McAfee standpoint where you have this strong brand who has a cult-like following, you pair that up with your media expertise and invest production investment, I think it makes for a good team. You even see now Stephen A. Smith is now branching out into YouTube and building his independent brand, kind of putting more pressure on ESPN to say, hey, pony up the dollars on that next deal, or, you know, he can easily just branch off and do his own thing. Um, My guy, Ariel Helwani, at at the time of this uh, recording, he has now just uh, partnered up with Yahoo Sports for his MMA and wrestling venture. Again, another guy who's built up a very strong brand within the mixed martial arts uh, um, field in that industry, and now finding an established media house in Yahoo Sports to partner with, while at the same time maintaining his independence and owning some of his content when it comes to the YouTube side as well. So it's a very, very interesting dynamic to see where the industry is going. Uh, another example, Omaha Productions signed my guys at Through the Wire podcast. Shout out to my guy, Pee Wee the Plug, another fellow Knicks fan. And so it, it just makes good business sense to, to partner up with the independent brand who has already created uh, strong brand equity and then pairing him with your production expertise. So, uh, so I like the way things are going. Do you think that there's a little bit of a move fast and break things aspect to that? Because there's a lot less red tape, you know, again, using the McAfee example. Yeah. He kind of is just throwing it out there off of his YouTube and it's a simulcast with ESPN. With ESPN. And you're seeing, you know, a lot of ESPN executives kind of bristle a little bit. So do you think that's overall good for the standing of media that, People are just kind of moving forward, or do you think that uh, some of those old school media types have a point? No, I, I think that's it's just a sign of the times where we are when it comes to media and even social media. You know, failing fast, learning from it, learning from your analytics, and then being able to pivot, staying flexible. I think that's just the name of the game, and and that's the the, the current environment and business model that we're in. As this thing is is evolving so quickly, there really are no traditional benchmarks that we can lean on to say whether or not a, a current path is is validated. There's nothing to validate it against. And so you have to be willing to experiment. You have to be able to fail fast, learn from it, and then be able to move on to the next thing. So kind of uh, wrapping up here, you've had a rise here where you've you're doing stuff with Sirius, did stuff with ESPN in the past, and have done a lot of stuff outside of Knicks Fan TV. So what is the next step for you and the next step for Knicks Fan TV as a brand? Yeah, so from the Knicks fan TV side, one of the things that uh, I really appreciate over the past few years is our ability to uh, acquire talent. You know, we, we've been bringing in some some really talented and sharp minds to our team, uh, whether it's Alex, it's JD Sports Talk, CK2K, Jeff Johnson, Jake Asman, who also does phenomenal work with the New York Jets. You know, Jake Asman has joined the team. Over over time, we've really been scouting and trying to bring in uh, some really fun, energetic, and, and sharp minds to our team, and, and we're going to continue to do so as we are in the offseason at the time of this recording. We're also looking to expand our content mix branching out further from post game and play by play and game of the week preview to additional content that that I really feel like the fans are are going to uh enjoy another aspect that that we really built on this past season was uh, traveling on the road to connect with our, our fans from all across the globe. As we talked about on this podcast, Knicks fans are global. They they are a global entity. And one of the things that I, I really value when, when we go out on the road and, and really, you know, touch the soil and, and greet the fans is how much they appreciate how much we bring them closer to the team and to New York. A lot of these people, some have lived in New York in the past and had to move for a variety of reasons. And so they truly value the platform for bringing 
bringing them closer to home. And so we want to get back out there, travel to different cities and continue to build and, and connect with the community. On the other side, we have the NBA report which is now two years old. And the NBA report is going to be providing general uh, NBA coverage from around the league, from basically a lot of the uh, league personnel, analysts and insiders who we built relationships with over the years. We're going to continue to do that from the NBA report side. Uh, just last year in the NBA finals, we, we launched our NBA finals post game show with Kenyon Martin. And so we are continuing to develop relationships with former players who are interested in getting into the podcast space to see if there's any synergy there and continue to, to build and march forward. Yeah, and that's just a tremendous amount of growth. A lot of awesome stuff happening. I couldn't let you get out of here without talking about the Knicks specifically for a second. So a really productive offseason. Uh, I got the Jalen Brunson extension done. OG Ananobi resigned. Mikael Bridges traded. You know, traded for Mikael Bridges. Bridges. Uh, what are your thoughts going into this season? A lot of T, a lot of fans, a lot of analysts are talking ch- championship aspirations. Uh, do you buy into that, or what's your feeling on the team heading into the year? Well, uh, it's going to be a, a season of high expectations. And so, for one, I hope that these guys will be able to handle it and really come together because I believe that they are getting closer. I believe they're getting closer. And, you know, there's so much Jalen Brunson has had a phenomenal off season with uh, signing his new deal, being named captain, new addition to his family. Seems like the world and the city of New York is, is really in the palm of his hand right now. But when we look at him as a leader and as a basketball player, what we've seen over the last two years, he's deserved every every bit of it. And so I'm very excited to see him really carry forward. This is the Brunson era that we are in. So I'm very excited to see him carry forward and carry this team. But he doesn't necessarily have to carry this team because they have help. I love the, the idea or the prospect of Mikhail Bridges and OG Ananobi operating on the wings. I mean, these are two guys who are legitimate defensive player of the year candidates, NBA all defense candidates. And so this next team is going to be well balanced. When you think about an all-star attack in Brunson and Randall, you're going to have shooting efficiency across the board, defense, stout defense. They're going to still have that, their rebounding edge. Uh, Tom Thibodeau at the helm. None of these guys, I think only this year, you will see two guys hit 30, Julius Randall and Josh Hart. So you have a, a team in their prime They have chemistry, at least off the court. On the court, we'll have to see how they infuse the new additions. But I love the way this this team is going. I love the direction that Leon Rose, World Wide West, and the organization have put themselves in. And so I I think, look, health is going to be their their biggest question mark. We'll have to see what happens at the backup five spot. But make no mistake, this is the best position that this New York Knicks team has been in a number of years, and I'm very excited about it. Yeah, something that I found interesting when I was researching Julius and his potential extension is that in the very small sample size, when they had OG and Julius and Jalen on the same floor, uh, Julius was assisting to OG a lot, like more than any other player for his numbers. And I think that's an encouraging sign because a lot of people are like, well, he's the odd man out. How is this going to work? I have a strange suspicion that they have an idea of what they're doing. So yeah. uh, I think uh, we have a, a lot of good stuff to look forward to for the Knicks this year, which is not something we've been able to say over the last two decades. So uh, yeah. so it's an exciting time for sure. Uh, CP, though, I appreciate your time so much. We had a little technical difficulties, but we managed through it. Uh, just uh, let everybody know where they can follow you and all the places on the on the internet. Yeah, sure. YouTube.com slash Knicks Fan TV. You also have YouTube.com slash at the NBA Report. Uh, you can find us on all social media platforms at Knicks Fan TV. I'm also available at CP the Franchise as well. And Omar, thanks again for having me on, man. Really appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you, CP, and make sure to follow him on all the places. We'll link that in the show notes. Make sure you follow the Deep Cover podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. New episodes every Thursday. We will see you all next week. Thank you again, CP, and see you guys later.